Hi, I'm Tom Kretschmar, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 Brooklyn Book Festival's Virtual Festival Day for a conversation with Alifair Burke and Kashana Cauley. If you're in New York City next week, the in-person festival takes place on October 1st in downtown Brooklyn. Before we begin, I want to let you know that the books by the authors in this program can be purchased in the link below. To tell you a bit of background biographical information about our authors, Alifair Burke is the New York Times best-selling author of 14 novels, including The Better Sister, The Wife, The Ex, and Find Me, in addition to the Under Suspicion series, co-authored with Mary Higgins Clark. A former prosecutor, Alifair now teaches criminal law at Hofstra University and lives in New York City. Her most recent work is Where Are the Children Now? Kashana Cauley is the author of The Survivalists, which was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and has been named the best book of 2023 so far by Today, People, Stylecaster, Elle, Harper's Bazaar, and the BBC. Kishan is a television writer, currently on strike, who's written for The Great North and The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, and a former contributing opinion writer for The New York Times. Also, while it's not stated in their official bios, I hope Alifair and Kishana won't mind my adding that they're alums of incredibly impressive law schools. Alifair graduated from Stanford Law and Kishana from Columbia Law. So with that said, let's get started talking about their incredibly impressive books. So I don't wanna risk dropping any spoilers into our conversation today. Uh, so I'd like to ask each of you to provide the audience with a description of your books that we're here to talk about, uh, each of which I really enjoyed reading. Let's do this alphabetically by name. So how about you go first, Alifair? Can you give us an over? Thanks, yeah. Tom. I appreciate that. Um, as you mentioned, um, I write both of my own books, uh, and I also had the pleasure of co-authoring a series of books with Mary Higgins Clark. So um, one of my most recent standalone book is a book called Find Me, but the book that came out uh, most recently is Where Are the Children Now, which is a sequel to Mary Higgins Clark's iconic novel, Where Are the Children, which um, you know was one of my favorite kind of early mystery books. A lot of my female writer friends kind of got sucked into domestic suspense through that early um, groundbreaking book. And Mary and I, before she passed, had talked about the possibility of revisiting that family to find out, you know, what is what are the children like um, in their adulthood? How were they traumatized by this horrible thing that happened to them? Um, you know, where are their parents kind of to, to revisit this family that so many people met, you know, uh, more than 40 years ago. So it was my pleasure to um, work with her family and um, her for the, the early ideas. Um, but that uh, I was happy to be able to kind of bring it over the finish line. And that book came out this year. And to any extent, and I completely defer to you, um, do you want to give the audience some overview of um, what the story of the book is? And of course, it's a mystery and a thriller. So if you'd prefer to stay away from that, I completely understand. No, of course. Um, so uh, for people who are familiar with Where Are the Children, part of what made it so groundbreaking is it was an early mystery novel where the danger wasn't far from home, right? It was uh, the idea that maybe uh, danger lurks close to home. And uh, Nancy Harmon's two children um, are kidnapped at the beginning of the book. And it brings up a past where she was a horrible crime victim Previously, she had been falsely accused of something. Um, she becomes a suspect again. So that was the original novel. So in the new novel, we meet the two children who are now grown. And um, Melissa is a successful podcaster and an attorney who works on wrongful conviction cases. Um, she's become part of criminal justice reform. Um, and you know everything seems to be picture perfect. And she's just met this man who seems an amazing. They fall in love pretty quickly. He's got a young daughter. Um, she's going to become a wife and a stepmother. Um, and uh, right as they are getting married, right after they're married, uh, the stepdaughter gets um, kidnapped or goes missing. And Melissa finds herself 
kind of under the same shadow of suspicion that her mother fell under when she was a child victim so many years earlier. So it echoes and she has to work with her mother and her brother to figure out, like to help this child. Thank you very much. Um, Kashana, would you like to tell us about the survivalists? Sure. Um, I usually call it a love story between uh, a man, a woman, and the vaguely survivalist cult they belong to. <laughs> um, Kishana, that's this is your first published novel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, when and how did you land on the survivalist premise? Well, um, I have been fascinated by survivalists for a really long time. Some of it comes from growing up in a house where we always had stockpile food and my parents are gun owners. We're, I'm originally from Wisconsin. It's gun country. And um, everybody is just like, well, I mean, you know, it's about hunting, right? It, like that was the official reason stated for guns when I was a kid. But as I grew up and as the laws and the, the culture changed, it got more into self-defense, home defense. Uh, my dad is a Second Amendment guy. He's very much like, I would like to hunt. I enjoy deer, venison, but he's also like a self-defense dude, you know, like, are the cops helpful? Are, if they're not, what if somebody were to come in here, you know, it's tough being a black family in a largely white environment. I, we have to protect ourselves, even if, violence is not the point and you know i don't want anybody thinking ah you know somebody walked through his door his plan is to blow them away or whatever but he just wanted to feel safe a lot of what i think he struggled with um is a desire for safety i that between that and when i was living in brooklyn there were two local cases i was following one of them was a young pair of house sitters down in the village they're in their 20s they had stockpiled a bunch of guns while they were house sitting in the village. And I was like, guys, like the biggest threat to you is that, you know, an omelet is 34 bucks. Like you're not, you're not actually in danger of anything. Why are you stockpiling guns? I followed their case for like a year. There was a guy on the end of my block in Brooklyn that came up right after I read about them stockpiling guns on top of a ramen shop. Nothing happened in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. Like if you Google it, it goes, well, there was a murder once in 1988. I had no idea why he was stockpiling guns either or what it was he was afraid of. So between those cases and my own background, I found myself just thinking, you know, what are people afraid of when they decide to stockpile guns or otherwise prepare for what they consider to be a big disastrous event between that and i actually got screwed by hurricane sandy i had to my husband was taking an actuarial exam and they canceled the version of it that was going to be in downtown manhattan because of the storm and so we actually flew to wisconsin where we're both from and then we couldn't go home for a month our power plant blew up on youtube um it was a, a kind of plant that got flooded and literally blew up like it's all sparks and everything you can still watch it and i we just spent a month on the road in hotels at our parents houses and i just wanted to go home the whole time i part of me felt bad you know as if there was something i could do if a hurricane rolled around and if, as if i had failed to be prepared which is garbage i mean i just lived in a neighborhood that got hit with a hurricane and like we were south of power, I think they called it. Like we just didn't have power in my apartment for a week and a half. And that's one of the reasons they kept canceling our flights home. You know, just New York was screwed. And so I guess between that tiny, why couldn't I have been more prepared for a hurricane, even though it's, you know, you can't solve hurricanes individually. Line of thought, my parents and those news articles, I guess I've just been bouncing around the idea of survivalism for maybe about 10 years. So I have a couple questions in response to that. The gun question, I'm going to save for a second. First question, you said when you were growing up, stockpiling in the house was stockpiling food in the guns. Guns is one, you know, it's palpable. You see a gun, like you clock that, however you're thinking about it. Did you recognize the food stockpiling as stockpiling? Yes, in the sense that I was like, this is a lot of food, guys. We're not going to eat this. I have a big family and everything, but just, I, sometimes in your kitchen, you know, I was like, what are the stacks of chili about? Like, what are we? So I just straight up asked them and they were like, well, you know, 
At the, the time, they were like extreme weather, which was constant as great at. Like, you could just be stuck in an ice storm and not be able to leave the house for a week. You could be stuck in a snowstorm. We had, it was tornado country to boot. And so it was just like, well, if we have that, if we have like tornadoes or ice storms or something, that way we have something to eat. You know, you guys, all you kids are always hungry. And I just, that seemed to be combined with their whole keeping you safe mentality. They just wanted to be prepared for a variety of things. I um I do understand from the book it's it's hard to miss um a theme which is uh well not that's for me to say perhaps you to say that the reader should be left with a more nuanced understanding of why guns may be in certain households in the United States um, whatever their respective position is on that um, if if I'm correct in that read you could say there's coastal understandings and now here's where I I don't know if uh, Alifair, I understand you. You grew up in Wichita, right? I did. I. It's not for me to say if um, Wisconsin and Kansas are more similar than they are different, or more different than they are similar. I'm actually curious, though, growing up in Wichita, what Kashan has described in terms of why people might have a survivalist mindset in Wisconsin. Did you see any of that in Wichita growing up? Yeah, I, I, I was nodding along for lots of reasons. I was enjoying the conversation, but I was also recognizing parts of that. Um, uh, I also come from a family of gun owners, um, but not necessarily, we didn't have the food hoarding, um, but my dad's not a hunter. He's actually opposed to hunting. Um, and he actually has, uh, I shouldn't speak for him, but you know, he would not be an NRA member. He's uh fine with a certain amount of gun regulation at the same time he really does like his guns and i kind of wonder when you were saying stockpiling weapons that's always it, it's a mystery to me because you really only have two hands so even if you're in the text, <laughs> like what are you doing with a hundred of them like you don't have a hundred arms like uh <laughs> and you know each one of them holds a lot of bullets so i'm always kind of fascinated by that and i have friends who are into that but um, Wichita actually did have a, um, and I think it affected my interest, my fascination in crime, even in my uh, world as a lawyer, I practice criminal law, I teach criminal law and criminal procedures. So I think um, my fascination in crime came from, there was a serial killer in Wichita, Kansas, who's actually back in the news again, because they think that he may have killed other people that he was not convicted of killing, but he called himself BTK, which stood for bind torture and kill which is a pretty dark thing to find out about you know when you're in the sixth grade um but he was active you know in my childhood years and he was not found for another 30 years so he really was kind of like a boogeyman who lurked over this relatively small um pretty provincial place like where people kind of wanted to think oh we're safe you know we don't live in new york city we live in wichita where it's safe whatever that means, right? And like my parents had moved to Wichita so I could go to good schools and like the loaded meaning of that, you know, having moved from South Florida. Um, and yet, you know, so I'm dragged away from the ocean and my friends <laughs> and where I got to go to the beach every day after school to this like cold place with no ocean at all. Um, and they're telling me it's because it's safe and you can go to good schools. And, and I turn on the news and there's some, you know, maniac killing everybody. And like, they should have map on the, the local news of the various places he had killed women and including children. And I'm like, isn't our new safe house, like right in the middle of all those pins on that map. I'm like, good job, Burks. <laughs> some good life decisions you're making here. Um, but the, the town, like, because of that, like there was definitely a fear mentality. And I think it was associated with, you know, people having guns, but it's changed over time. I don't live there now, but my niece and nephew do, but I wasn't afraid of getting hit by like random bullets because, you know, I passed a car too fast on the highway in high school or something, but they've definitely been more trained to avoid interactions and confrontations with people who might just look at them wrong and have a gun and shoot them, but I'm going on too long. But yeah, I was definitely nodding around along about like people are so afraid of the unknown and the, you know, the outsider who's going to break into your home. And that's not really where the statistically, this is just not where the dangers lie in this world. <clears throat> right on. Um, 
so I've got some, as you might expect, some questions I'm interested in asking that are targeted to each of you with respect to your book and your background. Um, I'll, when I get to those, I welcome any crosstalk between the two of you, of course. I think the audience would be thrilled to hear that. But of course, there's also some questions that I think speak, I know speak directly to both of you. Um, I want to bring one of those up right now. Um, well, all three of us are lawyers, right? Um, one of the core things lawyers do is problem solve, or said differently, navigating and coming out successfully on the other side of a situation that's unexpectedly arisen. I am not a fiction writer, but it occurs to me that what I just described is also by and large what fiction is all about. So to what extent do you feel your legal training has informed your writing in terms of the problem is ar problem arises, problem is addressed, problem is hopefully surmounted paradigm? That's a question for both of you. Kishana, do you have a preference as to whether you go first or not? I don't mind. I'll go first. Um, I think a lot of my characters have, are obvious problem solvers. They are people who are very much getting to the bottom of something. Even though I don't write like traditional mystery or whatever, you can just sort of see their minds working, see them stockpile information and work their way to the end of where that information leads them. I think it's hard to stop thinking like a lawyer, even as a fiction writer. But, but that honestly, I think that's a strength. It, so much, each novel does have its own problems to solve, and it was cool to just go to stockpile information and that see the problems kind of set up almost like pins in a bowling alley and knock them down one by one, much like you have to in the practice of law to get any sort of argument that makes sense. And Alfred. Yeah, um, thanks. I, I think for me, the biggest impact is, in, I mean, the substantive knowledge of criminal law and procedure, that's kind of helpful because I'm lazy sometimes as a writer and don't want to do research. So the fact that I kind of know it uh, without having to look it up is helpful, but that's more on the technical end. I would say as a storyteller, I think particularly if you try cases, if you think about it, a trial forces you to tell a story in a really somewhat unnatural way because you can't necessarily do it linearly. You have to do it witness by witness, which is never how you, for the most part, tell a story, one person's point of view at a time. Um, but I think it forces you to break a story down into its components and kind of rethink structure and how how do you, what order do you reveal those components to make it most compelling? And, and I see parallels in planning, you know, trial witness order and things like that to the plotting of a book that you can play with structure and play with point of view and kind of figure out which character should tell the reader, you know, what information and what order. So I almost kind of think of it as the same kind of thing cognitively. I, I love I love that. I love both of those answers. Um, Alfred, what you just said this morning when I was thinking about the conversation we're all going to be having, I thought back to a tweet from 2019 that a writer named Catherine Schultz wrote that I, I kind of saved in my email. Catherine Schultz was talking about being a journalist or any other form of professional writing, but it also really spoke to me as, as an attorney. I'm now going to to share the tweet, just very interested in the reaction from both of you as writers. And what she wrote was, I'm constantly amazed by how much of revision involves moving sentences from the wrong place to the right one. What a strange thing about the human mind. We can think reasonably well, yet entirely out of order. Any reaction to that in light of, from both of you? In, in, interaction with what you were just saying, Alfred? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're both nodding for a reason. And I've actually heard journalist friends kind of say something similar to that. So that was her background. Like Laura Lippman, for example, I think is a genius with structure. She'll tell things in completely, you know, backwards order sometimes or have a, a point of view where you're not even sure what character it is. It's kind of universal. So, um, and I think that 
I think she has said that she thinks being a journalist has helped her do that. And I think lawyers have the same thing. I'm in the middle of revision hell right now. So the, the thing about taking a sentence and putting it from the wrong place to the right place, my editor just kind of circled one line that didn't, to me, necessarily jump off the page. It was part of a flashback. And she was like, ah, this is such a good, like, standalone line about the origin of this friendship. And what if you started out the chapter that way and expanded upon it? So I'm like, ah, change again. <laughs> and then I did it last night and I kind of, the, it, it kind of broke everything open and really made that chapter so much stronger. And so I think, you know, the willingness to revisit those things and to um, tell things in the unusual, you know, order or point of view or something it does make a story more compelling, I think, and propulsive than if you just tell a story beginning to end from one point of view. Yeah. Ashana, anything to add? I um, have playlists for all my characters. They are all into certain types of music and I like putting on what they would listen to and getting deep, deep into their heads. Um, and what's really cool about the part of drafting where you're deep enough to question story order, I think, is in my case, I'm usually going into the characters' heads and the characters explaining where things belong. Um, and I love that. Like, I love going, oh, well, this is in the wrong place. Oh, you would have wanted to know this beforehand. It's funny. I, I refer to the beginnings of books as laying a foundation. Like, I guess I have not. <laughs> I'm sure you guys on drop this language I mean, if you don't lay a sufficient foundation all the things that you say afterwards don't make any sense and so it's really nice to after it's laid to kind of look at it and go you know have i lined this up properly do these these facts make sense in this order i i love it actually i think revision is probably more fun than a first draft okay this could be a really controversial question to ask but given the background each of you have do you think editors love working with you as compared to other writers um do you do given your <laughs> i mean every writer wants to, if their editor's doing their job they make you think so right <laughs> um because i wonder since you've been in writing rooms i mean i i mean i'm i think i'm more collaborative than a lot of writers are and i think maybe it was because i've had to work in group settings. Um, and I co-authored with Mary, which is kind of our own little writing room with give and take and learning how to bounce ideas instead of just, you know, going off to the sandbox by yourself. Um, so uh, my editor, so I've had the same editor for all 14 of my novels or we've worked together for 20 years now. Um, and, you know, when she gave me her notes, and she really sends some notes um, on the book I'm revising now. I told her like, I'll talk to you when I'm done hating you. <laughs> I emailed her after three days. I'm like, okay, I've stopped cursing you and talking bad about you behind your back. Like I can talk to you now. And, you know, it's been a few weeks of going back into the manuscript and, you know, I, I have thanked her. I'm like, you know, I know every time I give you a hard time, but I, I do think there are some writers who don't like notes and ignore them. And I think as an editor, I would find that frustrating because otherwise, you know, just hit print and send it out into the world. So I, I think hopefully, um, you know, I'm doing my part in the editor-writer relationship. Right. I'm going to move on to some particular questions about your respective books, but I would be remiss, at least accountable to myself, if I didn't first ask this. Kashani, you mentioned the playlist for each of your characters. Mm -hmm. What's a, like a particularly iconic Aretha song on her playlist? Are you uh, always on... Always on Time by Ja Rule and Ashanti. She listens to that song when she's road tripping with her friends in Chicago in college <laughs> for a night out. It's She thinks about that song anytime she happens to be on time anywhere. Um, like, it's, it's, lyrics are just so lovely and explanatory. And she's also just kind of an early aughts, like mid aughts. That's really when she came of age kind of girl. And that's what she was listening to then. That's great. That's great. Um, Alatra, I'm going to, to, to not put you on the spot, hopefully before we're done, I'm going to ask you, I'm not asking you now, your protagonist, if you had a signature song for her, what it would be, but we'll save that till the end. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Kishana, 
The Survivalists is a it's a very very funny book. And anyone familiar with your writing that preceded it will not at all be surprised how successfully funny your writing in The Survivalists is. But your writing background isn't just your work for The Daily Show and, and your phenomenally popular Twitter account. You've also got an impressive resume of writing very seriously about very serious issues, such as your opinion pieces for The New York Times. There are palpably important themes running through The Survivalists that aren't a joke at all, such as, of course, you know, the, the vulnerabilities that Black people face in America, including right here in New York City. So I'm really interested in hearing if, when you were writing The Survivalists, you had any sort of deliberate, actively conscious approach to how proportionate you were between the funny and the serious, or if it just flowed as the words were hitting the page? No, um, I'm a weirdo fiction writer in the sense that I will go back and insert jokes because I'm bored and I would like to be less bored. And so, and I have an internal sense of the pacing in my head, like when those things should occur. Jokes, um, like all other forms of writing, have a rhythm to them. You can, I speak all of my jokes out loud always to make sure they have the proper number of syllables, flow, et cetera, that the punchline is truly where it needs to be. I do that with all the serious writing too. I read that entire book out loud to myself maybe four times to try and make sure that in addition to the bigger macro issues that were covered, that the simply the sentences flowed, that they had a rhythm to them, that they, that the rhythm was correct. So yeah, um, and also I I love serious topics. I think there's a lot of great serious stuff to be discussed, but I like cutting it up with humor a lot, and I tried to affect to adjust the pacing so that that was done. So you could talk about something serious, and then you, like get a little rest, you know, in tone, over and over and over again. Very interesting answer because that that's forecasted uh, whether you realize it or not. Something else I was going to ask you about. Um, I remember reading some point in time years ago, you, somebody, whether it was first person or whether you're being interviewed, there's a question of how your Twitter, your Twitter voice, the comedy voice there. And if I'm recalling correctly, you've straight out said that was a, an exercise, that was a deliberate exercise to find a voice, the voice that hit, the voice that eventually um, exploded. And I think that's actually, particularly with comedy, successful company, that's exactly how people do it. You tinker, you spot, and maybe people though are less willing to freely admit that that's how they find a voice. They want it to seem organic. I think what I just heard you say, well, I know what I just heard you say. And if you have anything more to say about it, it sounds like you did the same exercise with the survivalists. You, you, reading it out, anything more to say on that point? Um, I do that with all my writing. What's funny is when I got to the Daily Show, everybody else did it there too. We were all just reading jokes out loud. We were reading jokes under our breaths. We were adjusting pacing, timing, et cetera. It was in a lot of ways a joy to meet 15 other writers who were just as obsessed with the patterns and the rhythms of language as I was. Yes, I, I did do that with Survivalist and I did it on purpose. And I don't care if it you know, if it seems like I put a lot of work into it, I did. And there's nothing wrong with putting a lot of work into how your writing sounds and what the tone of it is and how it comes across. And most of the writing I gravitate to in the wider world is also like that. I love a good prose stylist. I love somebody else who appears to be as obsessive with rhythm and pacing and whatnot and might have read their book out loud four times like I have. Um, Alifair, I have a variety of questions about um, how you went about writing Where Are the Children Now? Um, but while we're on the topic of voice, one of them is, uh, I know you start, I believe you started working with Mary Higgins Clark in 2014. Is that right? Pardon me, the first book you wrote together was published in 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we started the year before that, yeah. Um, I have not been able to pinpoint, I tried doing my homework, um, how much work you and, and Ms. Clark were able to do together um, before she passed on Where Are the Children Now? Um, but kind of what I'm going towards is in, in each of the books, and in particular, Where Are the Children Now? Is there, are there two different voices from each of you in play, or did you kind of come to a blended voice 
to the extent there were distinct voices, how how did that relationship between two of you work? Yeah, it's um, it's not an easy thing to answer. But um, so when we started, we you know we, we did the series together, um, and I knew that part of my role as a collaborator to a, a very big name best selling author was to help basically increase output, right? So that she could. I would write my own books, she would write her own books, and then we would each have an additional book a year doing this series together. Um, and it, I, I think it reads like a blended voice. Um, and that makes sense because we did it together and I would we would sit down and it was like a writing room. We would basically plot the whole thing out and storyboard it. And then we would write a synopsis kind of passing it back and forth that was like the Bible of the book. Um, that had all the components and then I would usually do a first draft and send it to her and then she would be like my characters don't talk like this and you know kind of I used to call it marry it up like <laughs> make it a Mary Higgins Clark book um, from the components that we had done together um, but she passed away in early 2020 when we were finishing a series book together um, and you know it was had been decided prior to that that she wanted me to finish it without her um and i felt like before when i was like oh it's only a first draft and i'm giving it to mary and then we're going to keep passing it back and forth knowing that she was gone i think i actually felt more of a responsibility to try to make it more her voice in fact than our blended voice um and then sp specifically the where are the children now sequel um I took a really long time reading that, writing that book because it's, you know, it's my plotting for the most part. We had talked about the ideas, but I, I plotted it out, but I really wanted it to feel like the original book. So it was almost, um, it, it's harder than writing my own book because I'm trying to write like somebody else. It's almost like, you know, you're imagining your friend sitting next to you and, and trying to imagine how she would say it, you know, or how she, what she would do. Um, so it was kind of, a, it was special to be able to do that. And I was terrified that her very, very loyal fans um, would be like, oh, with well, this monstrosity of a book, like, why did they do this? And it was, I got such lovely feedback from people saying like, it was kind of bittersweet to read because it felt so much like reading one of her books. And I took that as kind of the highest compliment, even though it's different than my own work, if that makes sense. <clears throat> of course. Um, so without, you know, getting to spoiler territory, um, an anchor character in Where the Children Now, Nancy, well, let me rephrase that, a character in Where the Children Now, Nancy, she was an anchor character in the book that preceded Where the Children Now. Um, did you, what was, what can you tell us about your thought process in coming to a view as to how much of a presence of a role Nancy should have in the sequel? Yeah, so she's, she's the mother and to some extent uh, her situation is what makes the tragedy come about. Like she's decided, she's a widow at this point, I'm not spoiled, that's revealed in the opening of the book. Um, and she kind of makes the decision that now that Melissa's getting married and is going to be a stepmother that she'll move closer to her and so Melissa and her brother are they're not quite estranged but they they sort of have an icy relationship and have grown apart and are two very different people now from each other and they get together to help their mother relocate um and it's when they're moving their mother that uh Melissa's stepdaughter um goes missing and she's not on the nancy's not on the page in most of the scenes she's certainly not a main character but i think the themes of the book are you know for people who have read and were affected by the original book there's some really really dark stuff that happens in that book and yet the book because of the time i think was written in this kind of light tone right and it's got a happy ending even though these horrible things happened um and this book kind of delves into the lingering trauma that this family did experience and they've all kind of tried to move past it and they're not talking about it um and then when this more recent event happens kind of they really have to be more open to each other about how they do have the um kind of lasting scars of the things that happened when the kids were small question for each of you um 
I'm interested in hearing what each of you has to say about the, the role of self-doubt in your protagonists. And I'll say with this one also, I'd love to the extent you want to converse with each other. I'd love to hear that too. So. Um, Aretha, the main character in the survivalist is almost entirely driven by self-doubt in a way. She's at the point at her law firm where she senses that she's not going to make a partner. And this has thrown her entire life into question to a certain extent. She has spent years pursuing this path, uh, arguing, you know, drafting and arguing motions, hanging out with lawyers at the firm to try and get more of a grip on what she's doing, talking to the partners. And when things start going awry, she's like, well, who am I now? If for some reason I don't want to just go to a smaller firm or go to the government or whatever, what am I going to do with myself? And her self-doubt ends up, you know, pushing her to dating this guy and living with a bunch of survivalists and a Brooklyn brownstone because she, in a lot of ways, doesn't want to face what's going on in the rest of her life. And it seems easier to consume a lot of the fear she has about who she is and what she should be doing in her life by preparing for the apocalypse. I, it's a really extreme take on self-doubt. But I think self-doubt can drag people to some really extreme places, especially, I mean, I come from a generation of people where you have no idea what it is you're going to do for a living, but it's impressed upon you that, you know, your career is really important. Your schooling is really important. You should have something resembling a career. But a lot of my friends have just, for whatever reason, many of their employments have not worked out due to the economy or whatever. We all used to joke that it, like somebody we knew got fired every year. And all of that will throw you into self-doubt. And so I guess Aretha is the typical product of the, the time she's from and the, the generation she's from. And the question a lot of people have about what, what, who am I outside of my career? And how do I even sustain a career? There's just a lot of doubt because there's not a lot of continuity in employment or anything like that. And But at the same time, when I was living in New York, a lot of people based a lot of their self-identity around what it is that they did. And so what what happens when you doubt all that is a major, major theme of the book. Yeah, I was probably a unifying <laughs> of all the characters I've created that probably all have imposter syndrome. <laughs> they're all, you know, they're all, all kind of faking it until they make it, as they say. And I'm sure that comes from my own internal um, self-doubt. I mean, I very transparent with the fact that it does not matter how well I'm doing any particular thing. I am still convinced that I'm getting lucky or I, you know, when I got into Stanford, I was like, oh no, like I'm going to be the dumbest person there. And then even when I started crushing my finals, I'm like, oh, I'm just good at this particular kind of test. And then like, then when I have to try a case, I'm like, oh, well, I'm book smart, but I don't know how to try a case. And then even when judges are telling me you're a great litigator, I'm still just like, oh, I just got like, you know, and my characters tend, I, I don't want them to be monolithic and all be like that. Um, but a character that when I'm revising now is very much like that. Um, but Melissa in Where Are the Children Now? She's kind of, she is filled with self doubt but doesn't know it. <laughs> and she's been finding control in her life by saying like, I'm a top notch student and I'm going to be a lawyer. I know exactly what I want. I know exactly my track, you know, like she wants her life to be completely predictable, just how she planned it. She sets her goals and she reaches them. And part of her brother's problem with her is, you know, she thinks her brother's a slacker. Her brother thinks you're just creating these artificial, um, you know, tracks for yourself so that you can be always in control instead of stopping and actually thinking about how you actually feel, <laughs> you know, whether you're actually happy or whether you're just saying you're happy because you achieved your goals. Um, and that's kind of part of what they have to get through together. I've had side characters who are very confident and cocky, but I actually have trouble writing them because I don't identify with it. <laughs> I look at some people who are very, very confident. And I call it unearned confidence, and I don't understand it. <laughs> um, how about um, kind of same question? Well, a different core component. I'm interested in hearing what each of you has to say about the issue of control and lack of control in each of your each of your books. Uh, Marisa, my main character, but also all of her friends in that book 
would like to have more control over their lives than they do. They have all, to a certain extent, been tossed out of employment situations and life situations, and they don't feel like they have control over their lives. All of them gravitate towards survivalism because it feels like a way to have control over your life. If you can't necessarily have a career that's successful, maybe you can learn how to filter water or keep enough food on hand for an emergency. It is really just kind of an off the wall way to attempt to control your life because you're pretending that you can control the big events that would drag you down to a food supply or a bunker that you would use, which is sort of ridiculous. You can't control anything that would put you in that situation. But they find their control in the little acts that they perform that make them feel like they're keeping themselves safe and prepared. And it's it's nuts that they've turned to this, but they don't have a lot of support from society, from the bigger community, from their employments, from other friends. And so they have decided that in lieu of looking for fulfillment in all of those areas, they will look for fulfillment within the house that they live in and the things that they can do to prepare for large catastrophes. I'm I'm in awe of that answer because I've got to say, uh, I'll confess when I think of people who are survivalists and gun hoarders and things, I always think they're acting out of, um, you know, either hatred of the other or fear. And you talking about it as a form of control. I'm like, oh, I bet like it's kind of turned it upside down for me. And um, when the shutdown happened you now in 2020, I found myself doing very peculiar things. Like I def like. I bought a big freezer from PC Richards, even though it's only me and my husband and filled it with all kinds of food from Bolt. Like I, I could have run a commercial restaurant out of my little tiny kitchen. And I'm like, what, like there's enough food here for, you know, three years, even though the grocery store is open, you know, like fresh directs making deliveries. And I realized like, I'm like, I, I knew that about myself. I'm like, I'm doing this to exercise some control over an out of control situation. And the, the parallels to hoarding are, are real. Um, so uh, we were talking about control. Oh yeah, so I, I definitely, the a character I'm writing now currently um, uh, is very much about like, she just needs order over her world. And she actually, I was nodding along Kashana when you said something about, you know, she, she thinks that she's gonna get rejected for partnership. She This character goes through the same thing of like, when she's kind of the writing on, on the wall there is like, they're not sure that she has partnership. Um, potential like instead of waiting to get the boot you know she suddenly decides you know that she wants to be a different kind of lawyer altogether that she doesn't want to be rejected and um, I'll just show myself the door so I can tell myself that I controlled the situation I am um, part of asking that question you know before reading and I obviously I spot I spot the control lack of control themes in um, where the children now yeah, also. But, but asking that question as well. So reading the survivalist, I had always had a vision in my head. If I was straightforward, what a, a prepper, so to speak, is driven by. But having viewing an introduction to that mindset, that exercise, that community through where Aretha is in her life, it made me stop and think, wait a second. For any number of people who start finding uh, attraction towards this um, uh, prepping lifestyle, lifestyle might be the wrong word, is it possible that's sort of an exacerbated version of um, whether it's the college student or the working professional who has a massive project due on Monday? So they're like, I'm going to clean my kitchen first because I... I can, that's a, that's a manageable, I, I probably didn't mean to finish the question. I felt, I felt I saw some nodding from Marika Shana. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I, I, I often just growing up in my parents' house, I was like, what could they be doing if this wasn't a goal of their lives? You know, like, are there hobbies or something? Are there other things? But I think um, my dad in particular, my parents are both from Chicago. I was actually nodding along Alifair earlier when you were mentioning the whole, so we moved someplace because it was safe thing. They wanted to get off of the south side of Chicago. And so that's why I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. It was safe. 
And I, as a result of that, they took themselves away from a lot, a lot of community they had in Chicago. And so instead of like going out there and like having, they have hobbies, they have friends, they see people. But I think in a way, the survivalism is replacing some of the community that I know they have. I've been down to Chicago. I've met tons of extended family, tons of like neighbors and stuff. It's a really rich community that my family is from there. Everybody bought their houses at the same time in the 1960s. Um, and everybody fled from further south in the Great Migration. And so everybody's been tight for like decades. And I just, some of that, the survivalism has provided some community for my parents. They have a neighbor who lives down the block who is really similar. And they talk about safety and what they're doing to feel safe with him, like a fair amount. Um, so yes, it's it's substituting for some of that, but also they've they form community in that way. And when I was researching survivalists, I found a lot of that too. There are folks who live in like survivalist communes, you know, where that's their community and everybody's staying safe together. Um what's funny is when I was in the Daily Show, we covered a left leaning one in Colorado, a bunch of folks living together and who wanted to have not what they saw as traditional right-leaning survivalist values, but to actually form some sort of collective. But since they had a fair amount of distrust about the communities and the people outside of their collective, they kind of wanted to close things down, have some guns and some food, and basically try to start a community, but with survivalist principles. It's, yeah, I, I honestly, before I thought about it, before I started asking my parents questions, before I watch a ton of YouTube videos as to what people are about. I definitely thought that of them as more separatist also. But I think humans have a natural tendency to want to form community. And I don't think, and the survivalism that I'm familiar with doesn't run away from that. These are still folks who are trying to find community, even if what they're doing seems, you know, alone and separatist. Um, I, I think we're, we're about towards the end of... Uh the time allotted for the conversation. Uh, got one, one more kind of heavyweight substantive question and two quick ones to close with. Um, for each of you, when, when you're thinking about how you choose to present your characters to your reader, you know, on my side, the civilian side, the reader side, I'm, I'm on the one hand, you as a strike that last part about on my side. As the author, I imagine there's this, this tension. You could beat your reader over the head with who exactly each character is. So there can be no confusion as to who they are. But, and Alfred, I know you were, as a prosecutor, you were working with juries, beating an audience over the head doesn't always, you know, inure them to, to where, how you want them to think of you. So, so then there's a, I got to scale it back. And I have to invest a certain amount of trust that my audience is going to understand who these characters really are. There are some very famous examples of the audience getting that wrong. Um, the movie Wall Street, Gordon Gecko, he's an anti-hero. But I mean, famously, people just half of them or more don't clock that. I'm very interested in each of you where you, where you kind of land on trusting the reader, or it's not even trusting the reader. Maybe you're okay with this some sort of indeterminateness about who the characters are? Or is it a very important need to, have, to leave nothing for confusion? That's such a good question. Um, it's nothing, it's never anything I reflected upon, but I definitely am of the camp of you've got to trust the reader kind of writer. Um, usually if somebody, like if you open, spoiler alert, if you start one of my books at least, and like I have couples seems like, perfect like picture perfect and so happy and you know smoochy have a lovely day at work I can't wait to sleep with you and get home like if they just seem like sickeningly happy there's probably something very wrong right somebody who seems really really nice might not be so nice when the doors are shut like um so I want my readers to get to know my characters the way you get to know somebody in real life right most people don't announce exactly who they are and what you can expect of them when you first meet them and if they do you should probably distrust that um my characters I want to be like real people and sometimes that takes time to get to know them and you know by the by the time the book ends 
I trust my readers to know the characters well enough that then everything kind of makes sense. It almost goes along with the plot. You're getting to know the characters the same way all the other secrets are getting revealed. Last two questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Kishana, please. Oh, I was going to respond to that too. Um, I, I like, I'm with Ella Fair on the I trust the reader end of the spectrum. I think we're taking a journey together. Like if you're picking up the survivalist, but like all, all journeys, everybody sees the journey slightly differently. Like if you and three of your friends went up to the top of the mountain and, or something, you would all describe how you got to the top of the mountain a little bit differently based on how you saw things and your perception of the experience. And so I'm, I'm happy with the idea that we're taking a trip together, but you're going to see it a little differently than I am. You're not necessarily like hanging out in the spot with the playlists or, or like seeing the same things that, you know, the characters are going through, but that's fine. It's, it's cool to have your own take on it. I have been completely wrong about books myself. Um, and I'm 100% comfortable with in terms of what the author meant to say versus how I thought. But I mean, if I'm enjoying the work, I think it's kind of a net win for everybody. Thank you both um, for, for that. To close this out, I'm gonna ask both questions at the same time. Whichever of you thinks of your answer first, jump in. Um, Al Fair, as I, as I previewed earlier, you know, Kashana is talking about a playlist for each of her characters. <laughs> I, I wanna know what Melissa's theme song is. And then Kashana, the question for you, parallel timeline, some sort of impending catastrophe, three writers living or dead who are in your survival house with you. And then if you want to go the bonus round, what each specific category of responsibility you and the other three writers are in charge of. <laughs> oh my God. All right, I'll do my, uh, so Melissa's a little pen on up and she likes, she's very, very kind of serious and business like as, of her forward-facing personality but she's actually a lot of fun around her trusted friends and family so I think her jam would be something like um this is how we do it by Montel Jordan I feel like she would dance on the bed <laughs> thank you Sean any thoughts who's in the house with you two writers Three the people. first I want the first person I'd invite would be S.A. Cosby um he wrote like Blacktop Wasteland and um razor blade tears and i just feel like if something went wrong he would have a way to fix that he just in his book his characters come across absolutely insane circumstances and they join up in these teams where you're just like how do these people even get along much less get along long enough to solve some mystery at the center of their lives in a satisfying way and i just think he takes such extreme circumstances and comes to such amazing entertaining um comforting solutions that he would bring some sort of skill to whatever catastrophe we were stuck stuck in um i'd also say sylvia moreno garcia um i just finished her book silver nitrate and i thought it was absolutely fantastic i think she sees more into people than a lot of authors like just her characters are so many layers i, I think that kind of fundamental insight into the human condition would be very, very awesome in a time of catastrophe. Uh, and honestly, I just, I this is gonna be a really random pick. I just read the autobiography, autobiography of Gucci Mane. I just think he would be a good storyteller. I think that no matter what would happen, he'd be recording some song about it. It would probably sound good. You can't be bored. He just has not lived a boring life. His life is so much plot. I've never read a memoir with that many things that happened to someone. And just, I mean, isn't a lot of whittling away the time at the end of the world boredom? He's He just doesn't seem like a boring dude. Excellent. Excellent answers um, all around and an excellent conversation. Uh, I'm really appreciative. I'm sure everyone watching this is equally appreciative. So I, I'd like to thank you both, Alex and Kashana, and everyone watching. Please remember, you can order books in the link below. And please consider making a donation to the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is celebrating its 18th year of presenting free literary programming. And as a reminder, if you're in New York City next week, the in-person festival takes place on October 1st in downtown Brooklyn. Alaf and Kashana, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.